Hello everyone and welcome to another video in a series of videos in which we're of course talking about statistics. In today's video we are going to be talking about an often difficult to understand concept which is called interaction. Now in this video I'm specifically going to be looking at interaction in a regression analysis context. But note that it's not limited to just regression analysis. You can actually apply it to many different other types of analyses. This video is an introduction and it's going to be followed up by another video where I'll be providing a practical guide as to how to analyze interaction within a SPSS or another statistical package. First, let's take a look at the definition of interaction. Because I was thinking before making this video, what do I think of when I think of interaction? And I was thinking, well, I think about two people having a conversation. But then I realized as I was looking at the definition, which is in this case, reciprocal action, effect or influence, that it is probably more than just that. As a matter of fact, two things interacting usually results in some kind of outcome. So then I was thinking, well, in that conversation case, what if you have two students that are studying for a test and they're studying in isolation, so separate from each other, maybe they will pass their exam just fine with a grade six. Well, now let's imagine that they are interacting, so they're studying together. Maybe their study outcome will be better, so they have an interaction effect. Due to their, their collaboration, they will now pass the test with a grade eight, let's say. Now, the opposite could be true as well. Maybe they don't work together well at all and their interaction has an adverse effect. Maybe they don't pass the exam. This is a very simplified example of interaction, but it actually translates quite well to how we look at it in epidemiological terms. And we will see that after this video. But before we dive deeper into interaction, let's do a quick recap on linear regression, which is what we're going to be used to build upon uh, interaction. Now, if you haven't watched my video yet on linear regression, make sure you do before continuing watching this video, because we're going to use that theory in this video. So in that last video, what we did was we wanted to quantify the relationship between two variables, in this case, BMI on the one hand and blood pressure on the other hand, where blood pressure was a dependent variable and BMI was the independent variable. To quantify that relationship, we use linear regression. And what we did with linear regression was we tried to find a line that fits through the data points that we can see here on the right in the best way possible. And we achieved that by ordinary least squares estimation which meant that we tried to find a line that fits the data points through such a way that the square distance from each data point and that regression line was minimized. And that estimation re resulted in the following line. It made it so that the square distances from that line and the data points was minimized. So that model resulted into a description of the relationship between an outcome, blood pressure, and a determinant, BMI. In estimating that line, we got a model that consisted of two basic components, namely an intercept or a beta zero coefficient and a slope or regression coefficient, the beta one coefficient. There is also an unobserved error term, but I won't be going into detail of that right now. If you wanna know what that is, review back to my other video on linear regression. So the estimation of that line resulted into the following model. The estimated blood pressure equals 27.171, plus 3.592 times BMI. So that indicates that for each unit increase in BMI, the estimated blood pressure goes up by 3.592 millimeters mercury. And also the intercept indicates that for a person with a BMI of zero, the estimated blood pressure equals 27.171 millimeters mercury. Okay, let's move on. So, in the last video, the situation was very simplified. We only had five data points and it was almost a perfect linear relationship. But now for this video, I want to use a bit more of a realistic example. The data are still simulated, but it reflects a bit more a realistic and relevant situation. Now, in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, there is still a lot to be learned. And I was thinking, maybe it's interesting to know whether there is a relationship between the viral load of a COVID-19 infection and the severity of the disease that it causes. It makes sense to think about it. The more virus there is in your body, the more severe the disease is. So that is in this case, the working hypothesis. Now let's say that we wanna express disease severity in terms of lung functioning and specifically the vital capacity in liters. 
It makes sense because after all, COVID-19 is primarily a respiratory disease. The vital capacity is the amount of air that you can expel after a full inhalation. Of course, higher values indicating a better lung functioning and lower values indicating a worse lung functioning. Now, subsequently, let's say that we want to express the viral load in number of cycle threshold values, or CT values for short. CT values, without going into too much technical detail, are a characteristic of the commonly known PCR test, which is used to determine whether somebody is infected with the COVID-19 infection or not. And it uses an amplification method going over multiple cycles in order to detect the virus in the body. And the more cycles it needs, the less material, virus material, is present in the body. In other words, the higher the CT value, the lower the viral load, and the lower the CT value, the higher the viral load. Now, please note that this is a very simplified take on this uh, value, and there's actually a lot of discussion about it. But for educational purposes, let's just assume that this is, in, in case, the truth. Now, since both of these variables are quantitative, we can thus perform a linear regression analysis. And that is exactly what we're going to be doing. And for educational purposes, once again, and simplicity's sake, we will assume that all model assumptions are met. But of course, make sure that when you're doing this practically, you always check that this is the case. First, of course, let's do the first thing at hand, and that is displaying our data visually. And in this case, we do that by using a scatter plot. We can see here on the y-axis our outcome, vital capacity, and on the x-axis the cycle threshold value. And we can already kind of see that there seems to be a positive relationship here, as we can see that for higher values of the cycle threshold value, higher values of the vital capacity are seen, which ties in with our hypothesis. The lower the viral load, so the higher the CT value, the better the lung functioning, thus a higher vital capacity. Now, of course, we want to quantify that relationship by using linear regression. And that is exactly what we've done. We'll try to fit a line using ordinary least squares, which is this line in this case, resulting into the following model. The estimated vital capacity equals 3.036 plus 0.055 times the CT value. In other words, for each unit in CT value that we increase, the estimated vital capacity goes up by 0.055 liters. Now let's look at interaction. What is the basic idea of interaction? Well, the basic idea of interaction is displayed quite well by this statement. What if the viral load of a COVID-19 infection has a larger impact on the vital capacity when somebody smokes? It makes sense because when you are smoking, your lung functioning is often already quite hampered. So maybe a COVID infection has an even larger impact for somebody who smokes compared to somebody who does not smoke. If that is the case, that means that the association or effect of viral load on the vital capacity is dependent on whether somebody smokes or not. In more epidemiological terms, we call this effect modification. In other words, the effect of viral load is modified by smoking. And if that is the case, we can no longer analyze the effect or association with data from both smokers and non-smokers in aggregate. We have to separately analyze them because their effects are different. But first, we of course have to look at what is that interaction effect. And we'll do that using a regression model analyzing interaction. And I'm going to show you what that looks like right now. So, in a regression model in which we investigate interaction, we add a so-called interaction term. An interaction term is nothing else than the product of the two separate independent variables that we're including. So in our case, the CT value multiplied by the smoking status of a person. That results in the following model. It looks a lot more complex, but let's digest it for a second. The estimated vital capacity equals the intercept, the beta zero, plus the beta one coefficient times CT value, those two values we have already seen. But now we also have a second coefficient for smoking, the beta two coefficient times smoking. And we also have what we, what we said, the interaction term, the beta three coefficient, in which we multiply CT value with smoking. So the beta three coefficient times CT value times smoking. And what this interaction term is, is that it quantifies the difference in association from viral load to vital capacity between smokers and non-smokers. In other words, the difference in the slope of those two regression lines. So 
In a sense, we have two regression lines, one for smokers, one for non-smokers, and the difference in the slope of those lines is the interaction term. And we'll see this graphically depicted in a second. So let's move on to the results now looking at interaction. So here we have exactly the same results as we saw earlier, but now we're distinguishing the dots between smokers and non-smokers. The orange dots indicating smokers, the blue dots indicating the non-smokers. And we can already see a little bit of a difference. We see that for non-smokers, that positive relationship that we saw earlier seems to hold still, but for smokers, it doesn't seem to be that case at all. As a matter of fact, if we draw two separate lines, two separate regression lines, which we estimate once again with ordinary least squares, we can in fact see that that is true. We can see that the slope for non-smokers is in fact a little bit steeper than the first line that we saw earlier, and we can see that the effect for smokers is actually almost non-existent. The line is almost flat, indicating a slope of zero, of course. Now, what is the corresponding model for this model with interaction? Well, it's right here. So we filled in that model with interaction that we saw earlier, and we get the following values. Now, this may seem very complex, so we will dissect it in a second. First, let's see what happens here. The estimated vital capacity equals 2.280 plus 0 0.099 times the CT value plus 1.836 times smoking minus 0 0.106 times CT value times smoking. Now, let's go to the next slide and let's completely deconstruct this model to see what every component means. So here we have the same graph, but there are a couple of modifications that I did. The first is that I extended the x-axis all the way to zero so that we can actually see the intercept of the regression line. And additionally, I also transposed the x-axis in such a way that it now increases one unit in CT value for each step that we see on the x-axis. So we can actually visualize the regression slope in a bit. Okay, let's start with the first component of the regression equation, the intercept. Where do we find that? Well, remember what the intercept indicated. It indicates the estimated value for vital capacity when all variables are zero. So for somebody with a CT value of zero, but also for somebody who is zero as a smoker. So that means that that person does not smoke. In other words, it's the estimated vital capacity for a non-smoker with a CT value of zero. So what does that mean? Well, it's the start of the regression line for non-smokers. And we can see that here, the start of the blue line, the non-smoker regression line. And we can see that it in fact equals 2.280 liters. And we can see that it's depicted by the star in our graph. Okay, that's all easy, the first component. Now onto the next, the regression slope, the beta one coefficient for CT value. What does that indicate? Well, it indicates the slope of the regression line for non-smokers. Why? Well, it's the effect of CT value on uh, vital capacity while holding all other variables constant. So all other variables are zero. So for non-smokers, because they are zero. So this shows you the, re the, the slope of the regression line for non-smokers. In other words, for a non-smoker, each unit increase in CT value increases the estimated vital capacity by 0 0.99 liters. All right, let's move on to the next component, the smoking coefficient. What does that tell us? Well, it shows us the association between smoking and vital capacity in liters while holding all other variables constant. In other words, it's the difference in vital capacity between smokers and non-smokers when the CT value is zero. So actually, it's the difference in intercept of the regression lines. And we can see that is actually true. The intercept for non-smokers was 2.280. And apparently, the line of the smoker starts somewhere just above 4. And we can see that it holds true, because 2.280 plus 1.836 equals roughly more than 4. OK, now we're going to the last component, the interaction term. What does that mean? Well, remember what I said, the interaction term quantifies the difference in effect of viral load on vital capacity between smokers and non-smokers. In other words, it's the difference in regression slope of the two lines. What do we see? Well, the slope of non-smokers was 0 0.99. The slope of smokers is almost zero, 
it's a bit more than that, it's negative in this case. Well, what do we need to go from a slope of 0 0.1 to a slope of 0? Well, we have to subtract 0 0.1 because that's the difference in slope. And we can see that this actually happens in the interaction term. It's not 0 0.1, but it's a little bit more, resulting into a just negative uh, slope for smokers. So what we can see is that the regression slope of smokers differs by 0 0.106 from the regression slope from non-smokers. And if we magnify, we can actually see that this is the case. So we see here the regression slope, so the difference in vital capacity for one step in CT value. And we want to know how much different is that slope from smokers compared to non-smokers. Now you may be wondering, why don't we just make two separate models and just plot those two slopes separately for smokers and non-smokers? Well, the nice thing about an interaction term is that since it is its own effect estimate, we can actually statistically test the interaction term. So we can statistically determine whether there is a relevant difference in effect. And then of course, the next step is of course to separately analyze those models. But if we separately analyze them to begin with, we can never statistically test if they are statistically different, which we can do with an interaction term, hence why it's so important and why we often use it. Now, some final remarks, some extensions of interaction. Like I said earlier in the beginning of this video, interaction is not unique to regression analysis. As a matter of fact, you can use it in all types of kind of analysis, for instance, the ANOVA, generalized linear models, etc. So it's not just re regression. Also, it can exist on multiple levels, so not just on the individual level. It can consist of different levels. And finally, it can also exist between more than just two variables. There are, also, there are always two variables, but it can also be three, four, or even more than that. But to keep it simple, I just looked at two variables in this case, and maybe someday we'll have a video with multiple variables. But for now, thanks for watching. In the next video, we'll have a practical guide on how to analyze interaction within SPSS.